Lisa Waitman. Welcome to Run Chats with Ron Runs NYC live in the Hilton, Tokyo. We're getting together here to do this this uh, pod number two live. This is like totally awesome. How are you? I'm really good. It's been such an amazing week. Great to share it with you. Yeah, and by amazing, let's uh, let's set the table a little bit for everybody who maybe hasn't been on Lisa's page recently. Osaka Marathon, little flight from Australia. Uh, how many hours, just so we all know? Uh, seven plus four. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I just know it's a lot. Uh, rolled into Osaka in an ultra competitive elite race field and throws down at 223 uh, PB or PR for US folks, but PB, um, huge, huge effort. Um, fourth place overall, I think maybe 10 seconds out of third. That's so just true. monster performance at Osaka. I mean, how excited are you about that? Totally stoked, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's four Olympics so far for me and to qualify for a fifth Olympics is pretty amazing and that's what we set out to do. Uh, I've been chasing a 223 for a very long time in my marathon career so to finally do it is uh, yeah really really special and uh, yeah to do it here and have such a wonderful race uh, yeah I, I couldn't be happier. Amazing. Um, we all put goals out there in life. Um, and just, again, to set the table for everybody, Lisa's 44, mom of a beautiful eight-year-old, Pete, who's hanging out in the room with us, Black is here, we've got the whole family, everybody's involved, but 44, mom, full-time employee of IBM, 20-plus years as a director, four Olympics, and most people, you know, as we're aging up, we're going the other way. So it's crazy inspiring for you to be putting faster goals out there and chasing them down and it's just amazing man it's got to feel like just incredible yeah if uh, i guess along the way along such a long journey we've had you know you you have moments where you think is it all worth it and should i just retire now and focus on other things and you know you certainly have those moments quite regularly to decide whether or not it's all worth it and to then continually put times on the board that I'm really proud of. I'm so glad that I didn't retire, you know, a couple of those moments in those crossroads that you have uh, because, yeah, we've had the most amazing week and uh, to run 223 at my age, I'm pretty proud of it. And, yeah, hopefully we can squeeze a bit more uh, in the next sort of one to two years. Yeah. So talk about the race a little bit. What was the course like? Um, I haven't seen Osaka um, wasn't able to watch it. One of the things that was a little disappointing, I mean, we're both big fans of Japan, as are your whole family, um, but for whatever reason, it just wasn't great, like kind of live coverage of the women, particularly like tracking and following them. And I don't think it was a really uh, easy race where people to really tune in and see. So what, tell us a little about the course, was it like, and how it was for you, like in the week itself and the race? Yeah, so I was really excited about this race because I haven't ran that many marathons where I've had a pacer that is exactly the pace that I've trained for. And so I knew coming into this race that I was going to have exactly that pacer and that there'd be other women wanting to run that pace too, plus a group of local men uh, joining in. So we ran as a group the lead pack for uh, 30K really. And it wasn't until 30K when the lead man pacer pulled to the side that things sort of got going from there and um, the pack broke up a little bit. But in that section, there was also uh, a little bit of a headwind and the hills started in that section. So I was aware there were some hills, but you know, you don't like to focus too much on that sort of <laughs> that part of the race. You just kind of want to experience it and not, you know, not let it get into your head. So uh, that section, I sort of dropped off a little bit of the pace. It got a bit quicker and I was already on PB pace. So I held I actually ran one of my fastest 5k uh, splits in that section where I typically would have, um, you know, really slowed down. So that was the goal of this. I think last set of podcasts that I did um, after Berlin, I was like, the goal for the next one is to hang tough in that 25 to 30 and then 30 to 35, just to, you know, really kind of see how much further I could hold. And, and I really wanted to do that this time without fearing blowing up. And I really, and I did that. I didn't slow down all that much. And it wasn't really until the last 7K where we had a bit of a headwind and we had the hills um, that I slowed down. And I I lost about 30 seconds um, in that section. But I think that was just natural terrain uh, and environmental factors rather than actually really um, changing my pace. So yeah, pretty special opportunity. Uh, little, you always, you know, want to finish your race and then start to dissect and be negative about, oh, I was so close to second, you know, eight, eight or 10 seconds or second. And 
But I kept stopping myself and said, like, no, we cannot do that. We can't go leave this race going, what if I had have done this, you know, because I hit all the other goals, you know, I was, I, I was able to hang tough and when I wanted to. And, um, and that really puts me in good stead for the next one to then try to, you know, hold it to the finish and, and, and get now into the, you know, the 222s hopefully in the next one. So yeah, it's exciting to know that that opportunity is there and how strong I felt in this race and to carry that on through the year and it should be an awesome year. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such an epic result. And so you had the pacer set it up and carry you all through and help work together, which is terrific, but that's when the going gets tough. And you, you took your experience from Berlin and you focused on it. I, and I'm sure you didn't just focus on it mentally. You probably were making a little bit of tweaks here and there in your training. I mean, did you do anything specific to like try to help you prepare for that, that maybe paid off in that race? Because most of us, even at the elite level, even at the pro level, which you're at running in four Olympics, like even when we really specifically try to address something, it almost always doesn't really come together the way we want. And in this case, it did in the hardest section of the course. So talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think this block, you know, I trained a lot better than anyone, any other, you know, in the, the only other block that I trained probably as well at, or, or not even quite close to, but, you know, very consistently was uh, in the lead up to when I ran Chicago, but unfortunately got food poisoning and um, that all went south. But uh, this one, I knew I was in good shape and I missed only two days of running in the whole block. Uh, one was because I uh, flakily... Uh, missed the bit of the road when I was doing one of my sessions and tripped over absolutely nothing and ended up on the ground um, and then took a, <laughs> took a day off <laughs> to uh, recover from just like, you know, just randomly falling on the road. Um, and another time where I'd gone back to work after our Christmas break and was a bit tired from adding everything in life back. Uh, after I mean, hang a on a second, you off. get tired. Are you, sure, are you sure that's possible? Because wait till we get to the second part of this story. But sorry, I just had to throw that in there. And hashtag header, header on the side of the road. Go on, keep going, keep going. Yeah, so this, the only other day off is when I kind of went, oh, I can't do this session today. I really need to just cut this and go home. Uh, and Lachlan agreed with me after two 1K reps that it was time to go home. And I, so they were the only two days that uh, I missed in the whole block. And I think that really showed um, the strength came out in, in being able to tick off every single run that was on the program. So he, he gave you an official out after the first two <laughs> Ks. <laughs> in other words, hashtag ripcord as well. Yeah, we, we've seen shots of him out on the bike out there on the side of the road with the wind blowing and the ruse jumping off in the background. So, you know, classic, classic stuff. But yeah, it's always fun when the, it's the husband-wife uh, interaction on coaching stuff like we talked about with Neely and her husband, man. Those are, those are easily the most humorous moments for sure. But um, So you, you changed, you made some tweaks, it came together. It's got to be amazing. And it's just incredible how runners, it doesn't matter whether you're a four-time Olympian like you or any of us, when it's over, instead of being like, hey, great job, you really pushed through, you did this, it's the first thing we do. Well... If I could have done this or that. So I'm glad that you're looking at it through the positive uh, viewfinder and just taking away what it is because it was a, just an incredible performance after so much travel and getting settled in. And, um, you know, it's a breakthrough, man. It's a huge breakthrough. And you got to celebrate it for sure. And it had to be extra special, you know, having Pete there, you know, having Lack there. I mean, he's, I'm sure, at mostly all of your races. You guys are a team like that. But, you know, having Pete there as well, did that uh, help you, like, dig a little bit deeper? Yeah, it did. And I think the the other special part of coming here to Japan and running Osaka and is that, you know, I've ran well here in Osaka Women's. And uh, the last time I was here, though, it was for the Olympic Games. And it was such a tough experience, um, you know, being away from Locke and Pete for – you know, almost 10 weeks and then going home and, and being in hotel quarantine. And, um, you know, that was pretty emotionally challenging. And if I'm completely honest, by the time I actually got to the moment of needing to get on the plane to go to come here for the Olympics, I was ready to go home. You know, mentally, I was missing Lock and Pete. It was, you know, challenging with all the COVID stuff. And, you know, there was all, always so much fear around the world at the time and to then be putting yourself more into that firing line seemed like a crazy thing to be doing. Um, so, you know, I really struggled with that and I didn't really um, prepare for myself, you know, for that mentally as much as I should have. So 
uh, yeah, it's certainly been wonderful to put, be, have that opportunity for the three of us to come here and, and really put a great result in the board. Yeah, I mean, it's such a special thing because it's a shared family experience. Um, and you chalk that up. And so most of us, you know, have like an epic race and we travel like around the world to get there. Um, in my case, a lot of us and most of the people I'm connected with so closely are part of this Abbott six star series and chasing a six star dream, you know, finishing all the six marathon majors. And we'll get into that a little bit because I know you're only one away. You just need Boston to finish yours off and you, you'll want to get to then that. Then I'll be as cool as you, Ron. Yeah, no, no, no. Everybody's cooler than me, man. I'm just an old dude who's run enough of them that I'm uh, collecting them, you know, at this point. I'm sure maybe I'll give Pete one to take back home because, you know, do I really need two? Although Tokyo Teddy has one and then I have Rue from YouTube That's from right. our Berlin trip. So right. Rue would really feel left out and it really would be inappropriate. I think it would be a serious problem for me. So I think I have to work on number three and then we'll, we'll take care of Pete. Um, so... Again, most of us, you finish a race like that, you crush it, uh, you're on top of the world, you run 223, sorry about that, and you know, we're going to be getting massages, we're going to be relaxing, we're going to have our feet up, but no, Lisa has to take uh, Pete and Locke, they're going to Tokyo Disneyland, they're out walking 45,000 steps a day, they're crushing junk food, and they're basically getting no sleep whatsoever, and the Tokyo Marathon comes up seven days later, and guess who had a bib on and ran in the race? Lisa Waitman signs up, dresses up, throws her bib on, and gets in the race. So let's talk about that completely insane back-to-back seven-day performance. Um, runs 231 in Tokyo, 13th place overall, seven days from Osaka, and all of the stuff that I just talked about. Um, that might even be more insane than running 223 in Osaka. Tell us about it. Well, it was an opportunity to run for A6 and, you know, I couldn't pass it up. I thought, well, you know, it was the fifth star that, you know, I needed in order to get the sixth and then I have Boston to go and I'm here and I have a bib and I, you know, I've got these cool shoes that, you know, I felt pretty recovered in the legs uh, I don't know, the whole Disney thing was pretty exhausting. I think we did like six and a half hours across uh, Tuesday and then another six and a half hours at Disney Sea. Uh, but we did have a really nice swimming pool. So I think that helped. We swam each afternoon and uh, got a bit of hydrotherapy and I, and I got a few massages from Locke bless him so team lock that's right so. <laughs> earning, earning his keep i didn't even have to ask like i just kept offering i was like nice. yes yeah. so i was if i'm gonna say no right yes <laughs> very nice so i think it was like a bit of encouragement there to just give this crazy plan and a, a bit of a legs so to speak so i got on the start line actually originally was uh, meant to pace one of my really great friends back home but she had a back injury and um, and then her husband had to have knee surgery and he was also meant to run here. And another girl from Australia was coming in our party of, um, you know, three apartments. And, and then in the end, it just fit, ended up being me. And so Locke and I were like, do we do it anyway? <laughs> so, um, so we did. And uh, look, I didn't set out to run 231. I set out to just try to get to the end as fast as I could without breaking anything. That was the goal. Uh, but as anyone that's ran Tokyo or if you had the opportunity to watch it, the start is like a stampede. And so I had no choice being in the front to go with the front pace. Otherwise it would have been like a bit disastrous. I might've ended up on the road again. So the first, uh, 5k was like an on sub 17 5k. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to be keeping <laughs> going on this one, <laughs> this pace. Um, but then it settled down from there. And then I felt most comfortable just kind of settling in, in the last 10k, um, to a pace that, you know, felt more like a leisurely, you know, run than, than the sub 17 5k that I did at the start. Yeah. But to finish, it was really special to have that opportunity to see what Tokyo is like and to experience it from a different perspective. So, you know, you go into the elite um, starting area with, you know, all these amazing women and, you know, it's nerve wracking because you have expectations on yourself. Whereas I had no expectation. My only nervousness was I'm going to all this effort and I really want the finisher medal. So I don't want to blow a car for, you know, <laughs> and so I had to work out how do I run this to get there as quick as I can, but without, you know, doing that. So. The nervousness was around, will my body let me down or will I make it um, more so than actually wanting to achieve a certain result or a certain time? 
Um, so I was a little worried, you know, here and there in the race when legs were getting a bit tired and, you know, what I'd be doing to them. But it all worked out and, you know, you get a bit of comp- you get, get a bit competitive with yourself anyway to pass the time, you know. So I was trying to, um, you know, I was running with actually a really nice group. One of the guys grabbed a cup, some cups of water and gave me a cup of water along the way. And um, so I ran with them for quite a large portion of the middle section. And that was good because you can switch off a bit having a group. And then uh, also I got to see some of the Australians that I knew were running that we caught up with after and they stopped and took photos and shouted out and I'm sort of waving and wishing them well. And um, so that was the beauty of experiencing it from a different lens, I think. Uh, I'm glad I had that opportunity because I haven't just ran a marathon for the enjoyment of running one before. And so this was, yeah, that that chance. Little crazy. Not sure I recommend it. Seven days apart. (laughs) But, um, But it's done now. Yeah. 223, 231, fastest two within seven days, probably in history. Um, and that 231 is still ranks incredibly high in Australia's marathon list. I mean, it's not like it's a time that isn't amazing in its own right. And that's seven days apart. So um, just truly amazing. Thanks, Ron. It's, uh, yeah, we're, we've certainly uh, taken the, I guess, the careful road. I, I think as a junior, I had eight tibial stress fractures and so I've always you know really done things carefully not taking too many risks I'm not a huge risk taker um and you know this was a bit risky but it was kind of nice to just try something different I mean you know where I'm at in my career I'm I I just wanted that opportunity to run Tokyo and and really experience it and it was there so it seemed you know like I would regret it if I hadn't have tried yeah I mean you have to be cautious obviously as you're moving forward and a chance to do something historic like five Olympic games, um, which it is just amazing, mind blowing, but to run in Tokyo, to run in this course, which now I've been blessed to do twice. It's just so amazing because the crowds are awesome, but you kind of have to engage them to, for them to be as awesome as you want them to be. It isn't the same as New York or a Boston or a London where the crowds just tend to be more boisterous. And I'm sure back home when you run in Australia too, we're louder or more wild by nature. And it's the opposite of Japan where everybody's just culturally, you know, just calm and so polite and so reserved. But if you say hello to them or you say gunbate, they just go bananas. They're going crazy. And then we were talking about Luigi because Luigi's right behind us over here. Mario Brothers. We had Mario Brothers That's costumes right. out on the course and people running with these crazy costumes and it just brings a whole different kind of energy. And I don't know, it's just such a beautiful and pure experience. And then just where we ran, like some of the sights you see, although of course at your speed, I'm not sure you can even see this stuff when you're blown by at your pace, but um, hopefully you got to enjoy some of the sights that you saw as well. Yeah, it was a good experience. Yeah, I think seeing the costumes and seeing the Mario Brothers group, I think it's a bit different at the moment too with the COVID and the fear of COVID. I think for a while here, you know, there was signs up, I know for the Olympics where people weren't allowed to cheer and things like that. So because of the fear of spreading germs with um, speaking out aloud. And um, so, you know, perhaps also that kind of toned down the crowd a bit um, from previous years, it would be my guess there too. So, cause they were a lot, things were a lot quieter than I did anticipate um, given her, how much I'd heard about bands and atmosphere and stuff on the course, the people were out there. They were definitely there yeah. cheering. It, there just wasn't that that loud, um, you know, that the noise and and all of that that I expected was going to be there. So, but hey, the just the participants, like seeing the sea of people come through when you're doing all of the switchbacks and you know being able to see the people I knew who were racing I thought that was amazing given how many people were running that event and I was actually able to see every single one of the Australians that I knew were running we were actually able to wave at each other was pretty remarkable yeah that's really cool um because uh, you're talking about the switchbacks I mean I had forgotten how many there were Mm. I mean I knew there were a bunch I just didn't realize there were that many and at, at times I'm like wait a minute, are they ahead of me? And I'm like, 
how is that? I know that person. They're ahead of me today. I'm like, oh, no, I think they're behind me. Like, I couldn't tell anymore, like, as it would loop around, like, who was ahead of me and who was trailing me. And it doesn't matter anyway, right? But the, the most important point is you're seeing people. People are shouting out your name. They're giving you a yell. People are yelling to me. And it was always at the moments I needed it. You know, when I started to feel like I was drifting a little or just feeling the effort a little bit, you know, somebody would yell out, go run, run to NYC, whatever. It was like, yes, like energy boost and just felt amazing. And, you know, photographers all over the course, crowds all over, definitely more sedate, but awesome. Yeah. And, you know, just for, uh, for your audience and crew back home in Australia and anybody who listens to the show, man, you got to put Tokyo on your bucket list. I mean... Obviously, you guys know I'm the hype person for running the Six Star Series, but it's just such an amazing adventure just to come to Japan, period. Um, you know, whether you get out to Kyoto and Osaka, where you guys were when you first started, or Hiroshima, or any of the other places, Lake Akoni, you know, just so many beautiful places. And of course, if you got the young ones like Pete, you got you to do Disney, Disney. <laughs> or Legoland or any of the other fun things here, because this is anime heaven here and yeah. costume heaven. Like, yeah. They're all about it. So, um Super cool. So you checked off two crazy boxes. You crushed two races in one. Three. Minute. Tokyo and Disney as well, Ron. Oh, <laughs> so sorry. We're going we're gonna to definitely make sure we highlight that and tag Tokyo Disney in this post as well. Thank you. Uh, totally awesome. But now you have five. You got five stars. And you saw you were part of the races today. It was a Guinness Book of Records for the most avid six-star finishers. We came into the race with like 8,300, eight, call it 8,500. We're over 10,000 now, um, maybe even closer to 11,000. So it was remarkable that it was that many runners earning a six star. And you have this bib that you get on your back and it says, I'm earning my six star today and you could write your name on there. And it's just so cool because mm -hmm. it just pulls all the other runners in to be able to support you personally and give you some love out on the course. Like, hey, my name's Lisa, my name's Ron, I'm running for a six star today. So um, I think that added like a whole other level of juice to the event yesterday. And now you're gonna be one away. So you're gonna have to pay this thing off. So Boston, so. It's, Boston it's there next, and yeah. you know, to finish it at Boston is even more epic. I Pretty mean, iconic. come on. Yeah. I mean, we're at 127 this year. So, you know, I'm sure there's no way on earth you would even think about this year with what you've just done or unless you want to run a marathon next <laughs> I weekend. Mean, I think I need a rest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think well, I'll have a rest this time. Yeah, let's, let's talk to your coach over here. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're running a marathon no. this week. Unless Pete, unless Pete says you're going to go somewhere else and run one because Pete's probably really in charge of this operation. I think you so. Know, if you really think about it. But so Boston's there, you know, that will be super cool. Yeah. Um, and you know, we would be excited to have you and have you be part of that elite field would be awesome. And, um, you know, get your hill work in, which I'm sure you have loads of hills available to you and you can be part of that great history. So next year will be 128. Think about that 128 Crazy. marathons. Mm -hmm. Amazing, right? Yeah. And all that history and all that lore and all of the amazing men and women that have towed the line there and produced it. So yeah. um, that's super exciting. And I think you were telling me on your treadmill, you have the course like programmed in. Yeah, I'm yeah. on running track. I feared I can watch the course and yeah, experience it on my easy runs and see even that, you know, the Nordic track, it changes the elevation as the course changes. So you can really experience that. And we've watched that a few times, uh, particularly in the lead up actually to the Olympics when I had to do some of the heat acclimation work. I was able to go through and, and watch each section of the course and experience that. So I have a fair idea as to what I'm going to experience when I have that opportunity to run there and, yeah, celebrate the six star. That'll be pretty cool. Very cool. And we got we got props. We got six stars all over the place That's here. it. That's it. We got it. two six stars. I actually got my second. <laughs> And there's only 40 of us in that class out of about 11,000. So that was really fun um, to be part of that festivity and that energy level yesterday. Um, and you will get to join the Six Star family, which is amazing. And I'm rooting for Sydney to become number seven because that'll be just an excuse for me to come down and visit you guys. That's so. right. Yeah, we're really hoping that's going to happen. There's so much hype about Sydney and you know all the elites are getting behind it and yeah we'd really love that opportunity to bring the world to australia it's a long trip over but it's absolutely worth it we've got a pretty amazing country oh gosh yeah and i can get to cross it off my bucket list because embarrassingly i haven't been there so 
Ron runs NYC has to hit the land of down under because otherwise Rue is going to just like cut me off. Rue might just take me out in the middle of the night, man. Rue's got the <laughs> boxing gloves on. I, I won't even see it coming. He'll just probably just come and take me out. And that'll be the end of me. Like what happened to Ron runs NYC? Taken out by Rue. You know, I mean, secretly, you probably have this all planned, you know, because like, I because I haven't come for a visit. But um, so what's next? I mean, that's just like the most amazing Literally the most amazing week uh, back to back for two races ever. You guys are getting ready to take the long trip home. What's next? Obviously, recovery, build, cycle in, really get yourself back together. Is any, I think I remember we might have talked about going after maybe a half marathon record or something like that, or no, just like no real like long term plans right now for anything special. Yeah, well, I think I've done enough marathons in the last week, so we'll hold off on that. Uh, but, but yeah, back home, um, back to work and Locke's back to work, Locke, Pete's back to school. So that's pretty much straight away. And then we'll hope to do some 10K and half marathon races locally and yeah, really run well across that circuit. Um, I ran a 10K PB in May last year. So we'll um, have another go at um, getting a faster 10K time. And, um, yeah, I'd really like to run a huge PR at the Gold Coast um, in the half. I hold the record there, which is 69.00, which I think is quite an old record now. It was um, set in 09, so when I was, you know, a young spring chicken. <laughs> so it'd be pretty funny to come back now and, um, yeah, and smash that one. So, yeah, that'd be a nice story, I think. So we'll give that a shot next. Love it. Yeah, that could be my excuse to come down. We're We're talking through the travel options right now i have to talk to coco the dog she's in charge of my budget <laughs> and has to decide whether or not i'm allowed to go on these extended trips or not but yeah if even if i can't get down there we'll obviously all be rooting for you and uh it's inspiring as hell man i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming over with everything you guys have had going on to come down and sit down and share some time before you guys fly home and and uh chat up the run chats audience and tell tell them all about this amazing work because they're going to be inspired as hell Thanks, Ron. Well, yeah, hopefully uh, I have inspired a few 40 plus year olds to uh, keep chasing your dreams because if someone had asked me, you know, or told me that I was going to be doing this when I was 44, I would have went, oh, are you kidding? Uh, especially as a youngster at 22, having had already about six stress fractures. So uh, yeah, you're never too old, I guess, to chase your dreams and uh, you know, at times we get exhausted and we need a break, but, um, yeah, give yourself another shot at something and you never know where it'll take you. That's the best final message ever. Um, really appreciate it, Lisa. Thanks so much for hopping on. Um, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get this, try to squeeze it in maybe between a couple of pods that are recorded. So it's a little more current for our audience because everybody knows about what went on with the race, but it'd be fun to hear your words. We'll see if we can squeeze it a little bit sooner, but um, thanks so much for coming on and, uh, and joining me. Uh, safe travels home. And as we tell the Run Chats audience at the end of every show, keep lacing them up, keep getting out the door, and always remember to stay in the fight. Done. Yay.